Tony Bloom Ministries welcomes you for the old time preaching from God's anointed word. The title of the message is Decide to Believe. There were two blondes that were sitting in a boat. The odd thing there was they were sitting in a boat on dry land. And there were these two other blondes that were riding down the road in the car. And they saw these blondes that were sitting in the boat and they said, what in the world are those two blondes doing sitting in the boat on dry land? And the other one said, I don't really know, but we'll find out. So they got close to them and rolled down the window and they said, "Uh, what are you doing sitting in the boat? And they said, well, we're just kind of getting ready to go somewhere. And the blonde in the car said, well, if you need directions, just let us know. Oh, okay. If you didn't get that, be sure to call Uber so you can get your ride home. You won't have to worry about driving yourself. The gospel is so simple. Jesus said, only believe and she will be well. Only believe. It could be so complicated. He could have said, have a lot of money. He could have said, have a big name. He could have said, climb a tree. He could have said all kind of things to do. But the gospel is still the same. Believe. Sounds too simple, but it's true. And I'm glad that it's simple because if it had been complicated, folks like you and I never would have been able to get in on God's plan. Our subject is decide to believe. It's wonderful that we can decide to believe. God has given us the ability to decide to believe. He has given us the power over our own destiny. We're not sovereign. We're not almighty. God is sovereign and supreme and He's almighty. But He has given us the power, if you will, the ability to decide our own destiny by believing. And actually, we decide our own destiny whether we believe or not. Because if you do not believe, you are in unbelief. Verses from John chapter 20 are used to show us that believing is a decision. We can decide to believe. We can decide to believe or not believe. The decision not to believe is called unbelief. And all of us have lived in unbelief as a sinner. But once presented with the good news of the gospel, we must and will decide to believe or not to believe. There is what is called resurrection evidence. The evidence of the resurrection, John saw and believed. John chapter 20 verse 8. Then went in also that other disciple which came first to the sepulcher, and he saw and believed. These two disciples come to the grave and they see what is called the resurrection evidence. Evidence of the resurrection says that it's real. There is open evidence. There is what the courts call open evidence. Because open evidence says this is undeniable, undisputed evidence. This is not closed evidence. This is open evidence. And what greater open evidence is there than the evidence of an open grave? An open, empty tomb. Somebody would say, well, you don't even need an empty tomb. Oh, yes, you do need an empty tomb. Because if you don't have an empty tomb, that means you have an occupied tomb. And if you have an occupied tomb, that means that you have a dead person in there. And if you have a dead person in there, we can all pack up and go home today and get ready to do burning hell because that's all where we'll all be going. If there's no living Savior, then we're still in our sins. The evidence of the resurrection, when He came to the grave and He saw, now He had seen... But he did not, as the Sunday school lesson will tell us, he did not go in. Once you go in, you can't get out. That is, once you go in, you have to decide whether to believe or not to believe. Some people have seen, they've seen on what the medical people call the periphery. 
They've seen on the outskirts. They've seen on the edges. But they hadn't gone in far enough to really know whether to make a decision or not. They don't want to go in far enough because if you go in far enough, you're going to have to decide to believe or not to believe. As long as they can depend on what somebody else says or what the preacher said or what somebody did in church and they hurt my feelings and they can have all these reasons to whether or not to believe. So if I don't get in church and if I don't decide to believe, it's always somebody else's fault. But once you see and go into the place where you're presented with the evidence of the open grave, not only the empty grave, but it's an open grave. The empty grave says that Jesus is not there anymore. Thank God for that. But the open grave says this is an open grave as a constant reminder that it is an empty grave. And someone says again, you don't need the stone rolled away. Yes, no, we don't need the stone rolled away. We believe anyway. But you do need the stone rolled away because if the stone were there today, you'd have all these people saying, "Uh uh-huh, the reason that stone ain't rolled away is because somebody's still in there. Well, they always come up with something. Jesus and God the Father and God the Holy Ghost made it possible to where they wouldn't have a leg to stand on They wouldn't be able to come up with anything because you've got an empty grave, you've got an open grave. John goes and he sees and he believes. And we have to decide to believe because of resurrection evidence. There's no reason not to believe when you consider an empty tomb and an open grave, Jesus Christ is risen from the dead. The resurrection evidence. The risen Lord. Thomas set stipulations as to whether or not he would believe. John saw and he believed. Peter wondered in himself. He departed and hadn't got things straightened out yet. But Jesus loves him and he dealt with him too. But John saw and he believed. And here is Thomas who sets stipulations on whether or not he will believe. Verses 24 to 29, but Thomas, one of the twelve called Didymus, who was evidently was a twin, was not with them when Jesus came. You get in a lot of trouble when you're not with the brothers and the sisters when Jesus comes. And you say, well, I read my Bible. He's there with me all the time at home. I know he is. But when you get to Hebrews chapter 10, verse 25, it says you ought to be together with everybody else when you're not sick and providentially hindered. What are you going to do then? When you read that part where it says you ought to give God what's expected of Him, you kind of bow back a little bit. Yeah, but I read my Bible every day. Yeah, but what are you reading? It tells you what to do. Thomas sets stipulations as to whether or not he will believe because when they were there and Jesus came, Thomas was not with him. The other disciples therefore said unto him, We have seen the Lord. And in Tony's words, he said, Yeah, Lord, right. Yeah, what Lord? But he said unto them, Except I shall see in his hands the print of the nails. Now, there are three stipulations that he puts as to whether he'll believe or not. This is the first one. I've got to see the print of the nails. And the second stipulation, and put my finger into the print of the nails. And then third stipulation, and thrust my hand into his side. Surely, with all those three stipulations, if all that doesn't happen, unless that happens, I will not believe. And after eight days again, his disciples were within, and Thomas with them. Then came Jesus, the doors being shut. That's what glorified human people do. They come when the doors are shut. You don't have to open the door. The doors being shut and stood in the midst and said, Peace be unto you. That's what Jesus said most of the time when he appeared to the disciples after the resurrection. He always says, Peace be unto you. And that's what he says to us today. Peace be unto you. That was enough to know who he was just by what he said. You and I are not looking for a sign in the clouds from heaven. Just by hearing his voice, just by reading his word, just by knowing what he said is enough to know that's him. Peace be unto you. 
Then saith he to Thomas, Reach hither thy finger, and behold my hands, and reach hither thy hand, and thrust it into my side, and be not faithless, but believing. The only thing there that's been made by man are the scars in the hands of Jesus. Jesus is, without doubt, and I've heard our discipleship pastors say it, I've heard elders say it, I've heard some more people say it, that Jesus is right now in heaven, this very moment, at the Father's right hand on the throne. He is a glorified human Christ. He's God Almighty, but He's glorified human. And when He came out of that grave, there was no more bloodshot eyes. There was no more red and swollen cheeks. There was no more bruised and badgered body. He was perfectly whole when He came out of that grave, glory to God. No more stains, no more sin marks, no more beating marks. He was perfectly whole except for what Thomas asked for. And that is the marks of resurrection, including the marks of the nails, the prints of the nails in his hands and his feet and his ribbon side. Exactly what Thomas asked for. We don't get everything we ask for all the time. But every time God in heaven, every time he looks at his hands, he said, you're engraving on the palms of my hands. He told Israel that. But when he looks at his hands, what does he see? He sees the same prints in his hands as Thomas saw. He sees the same nail marks in his feet that Thomas saw. And he sees the same ribbon side from which flowed blood and water. There is a fountain filled with blood, drawn from Emmanuel's veins, and sinners plunged beneath the flood, lose all their guilty stain. Praise God for the blood of the Lamb that was shed from the foundation of the world, was shed for the sins of the world. The blood that makes a vilest sinner clean. The blood that causes every devil to tremble in his boots. The blood that takes away all sin. The blood that sanctifies the very ground on which it was fallen. When they went into that grave that day and they saw the grave clothes lying there, if there had been a drop of blood in that grave, I don't know, I was not there and I didn't see, but if there had been one drop of blood in that grave, the whole place would have been sanctified by the presence of one drop of the precious blood of Jesus Christ. Thank you, Jesus. So what is Thomas's response? Thomas' response is the same thing that ours should be. He, Thomas answered and said unto him, My Lord and my God. He saw and he believed. Jesus saith unto him, Thomas, because thou hast seen me, thou hast believed. Blessed are they that have not seen and yet have believed. You and I were not there to see the empty grave. Some of us have seen it. Some of us have been to the Holy Land and they have seen the empty grave. They have seen the garden tomb. They have seen different places in Israel. I don't have to go to Israel to see a grave where no one is there. I don't have to go to Israel because I have the witness of the resurrection in my heart and life. And that's a whole lot cheaper than trying to buy an airplane ticket. Amen. Go to Israel. We have to be careful that we don't get on these things about you have this special anointing when you blow a shofar. Or you have this special anointing once you have been to Israel. And many people have told me that they feel the presence of God when they go to the grave. Yeah, but I can feel the presence of God when I go to where living people are too, not just the grave. Yeah. We have to be careful that we don't put all these stipulations. Well, I have this oil, and it's had ingredients, special ingredients. It came from the Holy Land. you got to use this oil. Yeah, but the Old Testament says you better not make any like it. And they're making it and said, oh, you've got to have this oil. This is really the real McCoy right here. This came from the Holy Land, but God said you better not make any like it. And they're doing 
opposite of what God says, just because they can make a little more money. It's money. Money, money, money. Money can be made from these artifacts and these articles and things. And you can buy all of them you want to. But don't think that it makes you more spiritual. Don't think that it makes you closer to God. Because all you got to do is believe. That's the deal. That's what puts you where God wants you to be. Pentecostals are guilty as anybody else. Yeah, I believe, but I got to be perfect. I got to do this and I got to do that. And we put all these other things as to, well, I get, need to be sanctified. Certainly we need to be sanctified. Certainly we need to be baptized in the Holy Spirit. Certainly we can believe God for divine healing. But the stipulation for going to heaven, the requirement for going to heaven, Jesus said, be born again and serve God. Amen. And when we start putting other things onto it, we're in a heap of trouble. Because it becomes a man-made religion. Jesus said, believe. Thomas, you've seen and you believe. Blessed are they who have not seen and yet believed. We have not seen with our physical eyes, but we believe. We believe the gospel. We believe the message of salvation. The written word, instead of spending the rest of our life trying to argue or find fault with the Bible. So many people do. Trying to disprove the supernatural. We should believe the simple good news of the gospel and thereby have eternal life through the name of Jesus Christ. Verses 30 and 31. And many other signs truly did Jesus in the presence of His disciples which are not written in this book. There are many other things that He did that are not written in the book. They're not written in the Bible. Because you don't have to have all these other things. And some people are always looking for something else. They're always looking for another experience. They're always looking for another word. They're always looking for another sign. And if that one sign would really help them to believe, God would probably give it to them. But the thing is, you always have to have one more. You always have to have one more word. You always have to have one more television program. You always have to have one more internet session. You always have to have one more radio show. It's always one more, one more, one more dollar, one more pamphlet, one more book. This is a great book. Yeah, it is. But there'll be another one come out next week. It's always another one. We've got the book. I'm sorry I haven't been able to read the book you told me about, but I have been able to read the book. And this supernatural, it's the Word of God. Instead of spending our life trying to argue with the Bible, trying to disprove the supernatural, all we have to do is just believe God's Word. Amen. These signs are written. There are many others that could have been written, but they're not written. We don't need them, but these are written that you might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you might have life through His name. We have life by simply believing. And God has to spend so much of His time, He doesn't have to, but in the sense that we're talking about in our own vernacular, He has to spend so much of His time proving Himself over and over and over. And it happened to Israel. He had to prove Himself over and over and over. And He said, ten times, these ten times, you've tempted me. Now, I don't know what ten times He's talking about, but I'm sure He knew that He knew what ten times He was talking about. God knows. And he has to prove himself over and over and over to us. But he shouldn't have to because the proof is not in the pudding. The proof is in the Word of God. These are written that you might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. And if the resurrection evidence, if the written Word of God, if the proof of His resurrection is not enough to convince us, then, yeah, we'll make a decision. Remember that our title is Decide to Believe. We'll either decide to believe or we'll decide not to believe. And someone said, I'm just not going to decide to believe today. I don't want to decide to believe today. Well, you've just made your decision. And your decision has been not to believe. To put off believing until tomorrow is to resign for unbelief for today. Paul says, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. How then shall they call on him in whom they have not Believed, And how shall they believe in Him of whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? Romans chapter 10 verses 13 and 14. And the obvious answer to these questions is they cannot and they will not.
But now we have heard and we have to decide to believe. Only believe. Only believe. All things are possible. Only believe. Jesus gives us the opportunity to believe God for the impossible. And what is believing? Believing is just accepting God's Word for what it is. And receiving Jesus for who He is. And believing what God says about our sin, about salvation. And it just says the ability to put our faith and trust in God and believe Him instead of going all in our own understanding and always coming up with a reason why this may or may not be true or this has to happen and that has to happen. And we always reason ourselves into it. And God just says, take all that reasoning, take all that man-made religiosity, take all that out of it and just simply believe my Word. Believe me for what I've said. Decide to believe. I have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back. No turning back. You have been listening to a message from God's Anointed Word entitled, Decide to Believe. Decide to believe today and make Jesus Christ your Savior and Lord. This has been a production of Tony Broom Ministries.